All right, so can everyone hear me? Volume's good? Excellent. Um, so yeah, as Robert said, I'm Tim Rosenblatt, the Agile Development Director at CloudSpace. Um, real quick before I get started, uh, just wanted to say thank you, you know, to, we got the sponsors, you guys, all the speakers, I know how long it takes to put together these presentations, everyone's done a good job, and a special, you know, thanks to Robert and Jason for putting this all together. Um, I also wanted to point out the logo. I absolutely love the logo. It's uh, it's like if you come to Access Conference, we will cut your head open and insert Rails knowledge directly into your brain. And I think that's awesome. Uh, would definitely save me a lot of time reading books and blog articles, but maybe we can work on that for next year. All right, so OAuth. Um, what is OAuth? Uh, it's an awesome way to for users to give third-party services access to their data uh, while reducing the risk involved in the whole process. And uh, during this whole presentation, I just want everyone to keep in mind, you know, one of the real simple metaphors uh, that's used actually on the OAuth site uh, is the idea of like a valet key for a car. Um, you know, uh, your real key obviously does everything with the car, but you can also have a valet key that doesn't open the trunk, doesn't open the glove compartment, uh, in some really, you know, new fancy cars, the, the car won't even drive more than a few miles with the valet key. Uh, and, you know, the analogy here is that it's uh, giving, it's, it's giving permission to something while still kind of keeping things under control. So there's a few parts to the presentation. Uh, first, I'm going to start with, you know, really what is OAuth, what isn't OAuth, and then why is OAuth even worth your time? Um, after that, we're going to go through some code. Uh, there's a really great tutorial written by uh, Hel Brandegard, and he's put together some great explanations on his site. Uh, he's actually the one that wrote the OAuth gem that I'm going to be covering, so you know his stuff is the best way to go. Um, I'm going to give links to the original tutorials at the end of the presentation, so don't worry about trying to copy down all the code. I just want everyone to get a sense of how little code it takes to actually make this happen. Uh, then after that, um, I'm going to do a quick rundown of what goes on behind the scenes in OAuth. Uh, in you know true Ruby form, the gem is going to take care of a lot of things that you as the uh, developer aren't going to have to worry about. But I think it's really good to at least be aware of these things so that you know what's going on behind the scenes, and you know you can just have a much deeper understanding of that. Uh, after that, we're going to look at a few add-ons and extensions that will make OAuth work better for you, uh, depending on what it is exactly that you're trying to do with it. Um, also, uh, if you've got a piece of paper, more likely a laptop in front of you, uh, please write down any notes you have during the presentation. Uh, I'm happy to answer all of them at the end, and I know how frustrating it can be to forget something mid-presentation. Um, so with that, let's get started. Uh, who knows OAuth just by a show of hands? Who knows what OAuth is? All right, awesome. So for those of you that do know, quick review. For those of you that don't, what is OAuth? <laughs> Gotta love these kids. <laughs> awesome, awesome. This is going to be a good crack. Um, so OAuth is a way to control access to things, usually web services and APIs and things like that. Um, you know, as Robert mentioned, let's take Twitter as an example. Uh, there's tons of apps out there that will post data to your Twitter account. And, you know, how do they get access to your Twitter account? Well, you give them your login and password. Uh, obviously, there's a big security vulnerability here, you know, giving out your credentials. Um, OAuth is the solution to this problem. With OAuth, you give out access to the application without giving out your login and password to the party accessing the application. Um, so, you know, this comic is for lulls and all, but don't try I don't want you to take away that OAuth is some type of just another login and password. Um, it's, it's really about authorizing permission for things. Uh, also, you know, OAuth isn't just for websites. You can use it for uh, Flash apps, mobile apps, desktop applications, a really wide variety of things. So, all right, Tim, great. Some techno hippie came up with some way, open source way of connecting some websites together. You know, who's, who's actually using this? Well, a lot of sites, big, small. We've got PhotoBucket using it. Uh, Netflix is using it for their API. TripIt, uh, SmugMug. Um, there's some company, Goggle.com. I think they make sunglasses. Uh, <laughs> Yahoo, exclamation point. Kind of an ugly color for a logo, but anyways, you know, 
OAuth is the real deal. There's a lot of people using this, a lot of big players. This is something that's going to be, you know, worth your time. Um, this is a screenshot, actually, of Yahoo's uh, OAuth screen for authorizing the uh, Flickr uploader. Uh, I see a couple Macs out there. So, you know, if you've used the OSX uh, Flickr uploader, you've probably had to go through this process already. And this is a really great example of a desktop app using OAuth to communicate with a web app. So what isn't OAuth? Um, OAuth is authorization, and it's not authentication. Um, and you know, what's the difference? Well, authentication is about proving that somebody is who they say they are. Uh, and you know, that's usually done with a login and password. Uh, you could just as easily do it you know, with uh, fingerprints or biometric scanners. Uh, it doesn't matter to OAuth. OAuth, uh, you know, that's not what it's about. It's not a login system. Um, OAuth is about authorization, and authorization is about permission. Permission to do things. You know, Alice has permission to something, and Bob does not. Sad Bob. Um, you know, uh, another example, OAuth is kind of like the hall pass you get in third grade. You know, it means you have permission to be somewhere. Um, so, one catch to this whole thing. Uh, what about fine-grained authorization? You know, what if you want people to have access to one part of an API but not another? Um, the reality of it is most systems don't work this way. Uh, most things are kind of all or nothing. Um, if you wanted, you could probably add some type of secondary authorization scheme on top of OAuth. Uh, or you could use, uh, you could set up two APIs. Let's say you wanted one for read access and one for read and write access. Uh, you could just require applications to register separately for each version, and you'd have that slightly more fine-grained uh, access control. And also, you know, this is an open standard. It's evolving. Right now, OAuth is at 1.0. If there's a lot of demand for something like this, they might go ahead and add it in the future. So if you're running a web service, you're probably going to want to integrate with uh, another web service at some point. And you know, if you have the choice to use OAuth or not, you might wonder, you know, why even use OAuth? Well, one reason is that people will trust you more. Um, you know, most websites out there are run by good people. Uh, if a legit web service that's being at, used by a lot of people is asking you for your login and password, you're probably safe giving it to them. You know, these guys have way better things to do with their time than log into your email and do something malicious. That being said, I don't personally like to give out my username and password, and I rarely do. Um, this means I miss out on a few cool features, but I'd rather you know, know that my information is secure. Um, not giving out my pet login and password, it minimizes the number of times that my username and password are stored next to each other in plain text somewhere. Um, you, know, you probably know if your uh, password is saved on a site for you to log into that site, Hopefully it's stored in a one-way hash, which means that you know, it's been encrypted so that it can never be decrypted. And then when you log in, it compares your encrypted version, and if it matches, you get in. Uh, the difference for logging into another site is that if it's stored in the database, even if that database is encrypted already, it has to be decrypted at some point in order to go over to the other site. And if it's being decrypted, it's in plain text, and that's a vulnerability. Um, and honestly, it's not that it's necessarily the fault of the people running these systems. Uh, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a bad situation all around. Um, linking systems together is one of the parts of the web you know, that makes it possible to create amazing value with really little work. Uh, functionality of one system can get integrated into another. Uh, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. It's a better allocation of resources. Um, but uh, you know, annoyingly, the only way to do it so far has been this stupid old model of you know, sharing usernames and passwords. Um, and there hasn't been anything better until now. So you know, when I see a site using OAuth, I know that the people running it are highly likely to be on the up and up. Uh, and it very nicely helps sidestep the whole issue of trust. You know, I'm sure that no one's going to do anything bad in my login and password, but if I don't even have to give it to them in the first place, they can't abuse it. Uh, plus, if they're making a responsible decision to go with something like OAuth, it's more likely that they're going to make responsible and well-informed decisions in other parts of their business. And, you know, I like responsible. I, I trust responsible. <laughs> Another reason to use OAuth is that if your security does happen to get breached, your users will be safer. You know, no one wants to get hacked, right? 
but every once in a while it does happen and I think a responsible company should inform its users if you know there are security breaches but you know if you're in the unfortunate situation of having to admit to your users that you left your zipper down isn't it nice to say that isn't it nice to know you can at least say to them well you know at least none of your data on remote systems was compromised uh, and this is way better than having to tell everyone look guys you gotta change all of your usernames and passwords on all the other systems. Uh, instead, with something like OAuth, you just let the remote system know and they can disable all your old access tokens in just one smooth move and everyone's safe. And finally, um, it's ridiculously simple to use OAuth. Um, there are libraries available out there uh, to make life easy and if you've set up OAuth to consume one API, uh, and you have to integrate another API, handling the OAuth part is gonna be the easiest part of the whole process. So now, I've been talking about why use OAuth to consume APIs, but you know, what if you're uh, providing the API? Why be an OAuth provider? Uh, first off, easier for you. You know, it's a one-time setup and then everybody has a standard and secure way to get authorization to your service. You can easily track which services are using your service as well as which users they're logging in as. Uh, and it's a lot harder to do that if everyone's using the same set of credentials. Um, one other thing is that, you know, your users can manage which applications have access to their site and uh, they can revoke access to any application at any time. Uh, and because the access revocation happens at your own site, it means that, you know, company X can't have a backup copy uh, sitting on the shelf somewhere of your username and password of all your, you know, uh, of all the people on your system. Um, also, because the authors made some really good decisions, uh, if a remote service does get totally compromised and manages to post bad data to your system, it's much easier to track and undo all the damage very quickly. Um, you can't really do this if everyone's using the same set of credentials to get access to your system. Um, now, I don't think anyone's actually done this yet, but you could probably use OAuth and something like Acts as versioned to create some kind of secure hybrid wiki system for, you know, your data. Um, so basically, OAuth can make you look good as well as making the people you work with look good. Um, another reason to uh, provide OAuth is uh, it's easy for developers to work with. And you know what Steve Ballmer says about developers. You know, developers, 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 developers. Uh, someone suggested I spray myself down with a sweat bottle, but I'll spare you guys that. <laughs> um, look at that guy, seriously. Um, <laughs> so yeah, developers. Uh, it is ridiculously e easy to integrate OAuth into their projects, which means that, you know, it's more likely they're gonna work with your system. Um, now, like I said, I have a couple slides showing just how, you know, little code it takes to integrate this whole thing. And it's not going to be some long, boring code demo because, honestly, there's not enough code for it to get very boring. All right. So, you know, you're working on an awesome project that's going to be totally popular, right? Well, if it's popular, other people are going to want to integrate with your system. And the more people that integrate with you, the more it cements you as a leader. You know, good times all around. Well, if this is the case, don't make your users uh, have to spread around their credentials to your service. You know, if company X has your users' credentials and they get hacked, you can easily get hacked as a follow-on. And who looks bad when you get hacked? You know, you do, and your users do. <laughs> oh, this one's my favorite. <laughs> All right, um, you know, so yeah, haha, it's funny that I pick on Twitter because of this. Uh, everyone loves picking on Twitter. Uh, but in this case, they're actually responding the right way. Um, presumably as a result of, you know, all this recent security issues, they've opened up access to an OAuth beta uh, for accessing uh, Twitter. Uh, and well, they opened up access. Uh, they actually got flooded re with requests for uh, joining the beta within a few hours and actually had to shut it down as a result. I wonder if they put up a fail whale when they got flooded with requests. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> There's only a minute, so unfortunately no. Uh, okay. Um, well, 
Uh, real quick about the fail whale. If you like the fail whale, Google for something called random whale. It'll pop the fail whale back up every once in a while. It's real easy to get to, and you can still use Twitter. Uh, and it's always really good for a laugh or two when the random whale pops up on top of a legitimate fail whale. Um, so anyways, regarding the mailing list thing, um, they have announced that any widely used Twitter apps are still going to be allowed to join the beta. Uh, so hopefully we're going to get to see the, the result of this sometime soon. And also hopefully they don't start relying on the OAuth access as a way of you know, generating money, uh, which they keep talking about. Uh, OAuth access really should be available to everyone. It's better for everyone uh, and regardless of their ability to pay for it. All right, so you know, another reason to provide OAuth is that you don't want to put your reputation on the back of dangerousurl.com, you know? And remember kids, every time your users give out their credentials to your system, to somebody else, you're sleeping with all of the other websites that it slept with. <laughs> Some of those websites might even run ASP.net. <laughs> And finally, you know, you help build the understanding in less savvy users that usernames and passwords aren't things just to be handed out whenever some web form asks them to. You know, you're helping build a better internet and that makes everyone feel good. Aww. <laughs> All right, so remember, developers heart APIs, users heart security, OAuth equals heart. All right, so, you know, what if you're thinking, Hey, you know, this, this secure authorization thing sounds like a pretty good idea. I should make my own. Well, you know, don't, as in, don't repeat yourself. Uh, we have a great authorization system right here. It's an open standard and it's available to everybody. Uh, there's no need to write another one, you know. Integrate OAuth and then spend your time doing something else, which hopefully involves a beach and maybe a drink with a tiny umbrella. So let's start uh, with the code demo, with the code stuff, and we'll talk about how to access a remote system with OAuth. Uh, now, if you're accessing a system that provides OAuth, you are a OAuth consumer. Um, and like I said, these are based off of uh, Pell's tutorials, uh, he, and he wrote the gem and plugin, so you know he knows his stuff inside out. So here's what it takes. Um, now, remember how I mentioned that the spec authors did some smart thinking? Well, you know, one of the good parts of OAuth is that in order for someone to consume your API, they have to register at your site. So if you're building a system to access somebody else's API, you're going to have to go register at their site. Um, this is almost always a painless process. It's really simple, only a few pieces of information. Uh, you're going to need to give the name of your app so that when users are on uh, the person's site, the site knows what to call you, uh, your app. Um, you also need the main application URL, which is you know, yourdomain.com, uh, the callback URL, which is something that's going to get used as an endpoint in the process, and then a support URL, which is, I think, a really clever thing to include um, right at this, um, because if there is any issues in the whole thing, it gives users the ability to know where they can go to get some support. Um, the callback URL is actually, I think, a really smart uh, thing because if someone uses your credentials to initiate an OAuth transaction with the provider, they're always going to get sent back to that callback URL. It's not something that gets handed around in the process. So, you know, if someone uses your credentials, the user is still going to get sent back to your legitimate site. Makes things a little bit safer. Um, so once you've given the provider your information, they're going to give you what you need to get into their system. Uh, you're going to get a consumer key, a consumer secret, and this is kind of like a login and password for their system. Um, you're not going to need to type these by hand, so it's going to be a really long, pseudo-random jumble of characters. Uh, you're also going to get a few URLs, the request token URL, the access token URL, and the uh, author authorization URL. And uh, right now, just know that these are a couple URLs you're going to use during the process. I will, uh, we'll cover this in a little bit. All right, so you know, now you're registered for the system, time to actually start doing some code. Um, obviously, everyone has different ways to organize their code, so we're just going to cover the steps that are required in the process. And you know, it's uh, up to you to actually integrate that into a model or a library or however you want. Um, so the first step, pseudo gem install OAuth, easy. Um, now, like I said, if you're using this to consume an OAuth API, you're an OAuth consumer, so you need to require the consumer libraries. 
So when your code is ready to do the actual request, you're gonna set it up with the consumer key and the consumer secret that you got during that registration process, and you're gonna get back a consumer object. Um, from here, you're gonna need to get a OAuth request token. It's just a simple call like that. It's gonna go out to the remote service, get a request token, and give it to you. Uh, at this point, the request token is basically like a key without a lock. Uh, and in the next step, we're gonna make it actually un uh, useful for something. So you take the request token, you're gonna get the authorization URL out of it, uh, and then you redirect your users to the remote service. From here, the remote service is gonna take over and uh, authenticate that, and authenticate them. Um, and remember, you know, OAuth is about authorization, not authentication. Uh, the remote service is gonna handle proving the identity of the user by whatever means they feel necessary. Uh, whether it be cookie, direct login, knock knock joke, click the picture of the monkey, whatever. After they finish the authentication, they're gonna get redirected back to your system and at this point, the request token will have been activated. Um, so, and you know, like I said, uh, with, the request, with the callback URL being stored in their system, good security measure, it makes it a little bit harder to tamper with the whole process. Uh, really what this is doing is it's putting security in the hands of the people who are running the API rather than some third party. Uh, because really, if you think about it, you know, if their database isn't secure, you know, the whole thing is for nothing. So by keeping the endpoint in their database, it's just as safe as the rest of, the, uh, as the rest of their system. Okay, so at this point, your user's been sent back, the request token has been authorized, uh, and this is gonna be what you're gonna use to get the actual access token, which is going to be how you make the calls back and forth. So you just do this call, you get the access token, uh, it's gonna go out again to the remote service and pull this data back. Um, the access token is its own object, and it has a few methods built into it, which are gonna make it real easy to do all the back and forth that you need. Um, for example, you have a get and you have post methods. And these are gonna work pretty much like regular you know, net HTTP requests, so no hidden magic here. Uh, and actually the response that you get is a standard net HTTP uh, Ruby response object. Um, and you know, from there on out, you deal with it just as you normally would, response body, so on and so forth. Um, you know, so overall, really simple. There's that initial setup process, which is like 10 minutes worth of work. Uh, there's a little bit of co code, which is just copy-paste, pretty much, and you're on your way to consuming OAuth-protected APIs. Um, so, you know, this is some useful stuff, but, you know, I bet you're sitting there thinking, you know, gee, Tim, this is pretty cool stuff. I wanna use OAuth to protect my API. How can I do that? Well hypothetical audience member, I've got the answer in the next few slides. Um, if you allow access to your API, you're a OAuth provider, and like I said, being an OAuth provider is great. Um, one nice bonus is that because you're working with an open standard, it makes it really easy to build on top of. Uh, for example, rate limiting is something that lots of, API, uh, lots of APIs want, and it's really, really easy to add using OAuth. So again, basing this off of Pell's tutorial, and I'll include the links at the end. Um, now, there are a couple options out there for doing this whole thing. I like his gem uh, for a couple reasons. Uh, he includes a controller that uh, will let your users manage their own request token, or their own access tokens. And uh, like I said, you know, they can manage and revoke access tokens you know, all by themselves. Uh, it's really easy, really simple, and very secure. Um, also, the gem is set up by default to use HMAC SHA-1 encryption uh, for all the transactions, which is a good thing. It's secure by default. Uh, and also, you're gonna get a set of four filters, which you can use to protect your actions with. Uh, and these will integrate with some of the popular uh, authentication plugins, which, by the way, is one of the catches. To do this, you are, do need to be using an authentication plugin on your site. Acts is authenticated, RESTful authentication and RESTful OpenID authentication will all work just fine. So to get started, if you hadn't already, sudo gem install OAuth. Uh, from there, you need to install the OAuth plugin, which you can pull down off of the Google Code site. All right, so we've got the code installed on the system, time to actually start doing the integration. 
uh, just run script generate OAuth provider, and it's going to do its magic and give you a bunch of uh, uh, controller, a couple of models, and also uh, some routes. Uh, I don't believe the generator is going to install these routes automatically, so you're just going to need to copy and paste them in. Um, as you can see, there's a few of them, uh, and they all are endpoints that are involved in the whole process. Uh, you could change the routes, the, route, the, the names. I recommend not doing this. It's, you know, they're all namespaced under OAuth. If you're not using OAuth, you probably don't have anything called <laughs> OAuth already. And uh, these are some of the defaults that'll just make it a little bit simpler for people to work with. Um, so since OAuth is going to allow a remote system to act like a user on your system, you're going to need to add a few associations to your user model. And then finally, run the migrations that were uh, created during the process, restart your server, and you're good to go. Uh, now from here, you've got the ability to protect individual actions or controllers in the same way, uh, using OAuth, in the same way that you do with your regular system. Um, you're probably used to like a current user object uh, representing the currently logged in user, and you're going to get the same thing uh, with OAuth. So all your code is going to work just the same. Um, now you can set whole controllers to be accessible via OAuth and login. You can protect specific actions uh, with OAuth and login, or you can make certain things, you know, uh, OAuth only. And uh, that's actually the end of integrating OAuth into a Rails project. So this is a diagram of the whole flow of uh, data representing an OAuth transaction. Um, and this whole process assumes that you've already gone to the provider site, registered, and that's all been taken care of. Now, when the process starts, the OAuth consumer asks for that request token we talked about. Um, and as part of this request, the consumer key that you provided is sent along with a nonce. Uh, a nonce is, what's, uh, is short for number used once. And the reason nonces are involved is that it, it prevents replay attacks from being done. Uh, you know, obviously if the number's been used once, it can't be used again. Uh, in addition to this, another important piece of data is the signature method. Um, OAuth transactions are encrypted, uh, and the signature method tells you what encryption method's being used. Now, like I said, the gem that we just talked about uses uh, HMAC SHA-1 by default. There's also RSA SHA-1 and plain text. Uh, plain text doesn't sound like a very good encryption algorithm because it's, <laughs> it's not. Uh, but actually, you know, the spec says if you're using plain text, it has to be of over an already encrypted uh, communication protocol like HTTPS. So the provider is going to respond to the request with a request token and a token secret. And remember, you know, at this point, the request token isn't valid yet. Um, you're going to have to, or the consumer is going to have to direct the user to the site where the uh, authentication will happen. At that point, the user will get sent back, and the request token will already have been marked in the provider system as valid. So the next OAuth action that takes place is the consumer asking the provider for the access token. And you know, remember that this is what actually lets the get and post uh, methods get called and lets data go back and forth. Um, the request token is going to get sent along with the consumer key, the signature, the timestamp of the transaction, and as with all of the other steps in here, there's a nonce going back and forth. Every transaction is going to have a nonce. And then the reply to the access request comes back. It's the access token and a token secret, and that's the specific token that's going to be tied to your application ID and the particular user that authenticated uh, your access. Uh, and, you know, that's how you can keep track of who's doing what information transmission. So, you know, like I said, there's a few more steps and a few more pieces of data being pa uh, passed back and forth uh, than were mentioned in the code. Uh, and, you know, like I said, that's one of the nice things. You don't have to worry about this. Um, in this whole process, uh, there's actually seven transfers back and forth between the remote system and uh, the consumer. Um, and each of these transactions requires another endpoint, which is what all those different things were that we got earlier in the process. Um, but you know, like I said, it's really simple to do in code, and especially considering the value that you're going to get out of this, it's totally worth your time. Okay, um, so that's you know, OAuth in a nutshell, uh, front to back, simple process. 
There's a few steps thanks to the magic of Ruby gems, uh, and it pretty much works out of the box. Um, but you know, that's not all we can do with OAuth. Um, just like with everything else, there's a lot of customizations we can do. Uh, a lot of them are really simple, and you can get really good results out of this. For example, um, you know, those keys. OAuth uses these really long strings of pseudo-random, very hard to guess uh, tokens. And you know, that's great because you don't have to type them and they're hard to guess so no one, so it's less likely that someone's gonna be able to hack into this whole process. Um, but you know, imagine a situation where you did have to type them. Um, maybe some device doesn't have a web browser or something like that. Uh, but still has an internet connection, you know, uh, maybe a cell phone, some type of set-top device, um, digital photo albums, you know, whatever it is. Uh, if you can't get the authentication key to the device via the normal back and forth of the, with the HTTP, uh, the only option you have is to type it in. Uh, and it would suck to type, a, you know, these really ridiculously long and random strings uh, on a device with, you know, really limited inputs. Um, so the spec actually covers this, and what they say is that if the system being accessed is intended to be accessed from a device like this, uh, the auth keys should be generated in a way that makes it possible to put them in. Um, you know, maybe compose it with simple words and numbers uh, rather than just garbage, long garbage characters. It makes it a little simple. If you got just a, uh, you know, uh, some type of joystick input, you could do the, you know, contra, up, up, down, down, left, right kind of, you know, secret codes for getting access. Whatever, whatever it is, it's a clever idea on the part of the spec authors. Okay, so, you know, let's keep talking about the access tokens. Um, the access tokens can be set to expire on whatever schedule you want, a month, six months, a year, whatever, you know, it's up to you as the provider. Um, but, you know, think about going about it the other way with short life access tokens. Um, you know, lots of systems do this, uh, hey, let's log into your email account and check your address book and see if your friends are using our system. Um, you know, how long could it possibly take to pull down an address book? Just a couple minutes, right? Well, you know, in the interest of only giving out permissions that you need to, you could make OAuth send out only, you know, 10 minute access tokens, which is more than enough time for the remote system to get in, do its business, get out, and then they're blocked from ever doing it again. Um, this is a ridiculously simple change to make, technically speaking, but again, it's a lot of value for the amount of effort that you're putting into it. Okay, so you know, you're the API provider, uh, and you're cool with people accessing your system. Uh, you're not charging for the service, uh, and although you know most people won't abuse it, it is the internet, and you know sometimes you need a few restrictions. Uh, you know, good fences make good neighbors, goes the saying. Um, well, for an API, this comes in the form of rate limiting. Uh, you know, set fair limits and then enforce them. Uh, with an OAuth, this is ridiculously simple. Um, so this tip comes courtesy of John Sampson of Zentact. Uh, Zentact uh, is implementing OAuth for their upcoming API uh, that we're working on, and he came up with this idea. Uh, you know, fair disclosure, uh, CloudSpace has worked with Zentact, uh, but that being said, I think Zentact is a really cool system that, you know, is perfect for people who come to conferences and do networking things. Strongly recommended to go check it out. Um, so, you know, enough of the shameless self-promotion. Um, back to the rate limiting. Um, these nonces, remember these things, numbers used once? Well, if, it's, if it can only be used once, it's got to be written down somewhere so that you can know if someone's using it again, right? Um, well, there's a table that records all of these nonces. And all you've got to do is make a migration that adds application ID to this table, modify the controller a little bit to store the, or the model to store the uh, application ID in the database. Um, so from here, you've got the app ID, you've got the number of nonce rows, and you've got timestamps. Uh, from here, it's a trivial just count operation with, the time, with the, a time frame, and you know how many accesses someone has done over whatever time frame you specify. Uh, it'd be very easy to add to the controller and say, you know, if count greater than my personal comfort level, access revoked. Uh, and you know, this is a really great way of taking advantage of the fact that you're already storing this information anyways, um, which is one of the nice parts about doing it with OAuth. Um, okay, two for one. 
Uh, I think I've shown some really compelling reasons to use OAuth just by itself. Uh, and, you know, it's good standalone, and these are some good improvements. But you know, you can double up here. Um, Plaxo and Google are working on a test project to combine OAuth and OpenID. Uh, right now, it's just a test so that Plaxo members can invite uh, new members via Gmail. Um, but here's the, you know, the idea is that, you know, we showed uh, there's like seven steps back and forth in this whole process. Obviously, there's a lot going on back and forth, and, you know, that takes up time and resources. The idea with this project is that, you know, with OpenID also, there's a lot of back and forth. Why not combine the two? Um, there's no way around the back and forth. You have to get the data from point A to point B. But if we combine the transactions into one set, there's less back and forth, simpler for your users, faster for your users. Uh, and I really hope that this works out for them. Uh, they've published a draft of an extension to the OAuth spec, uh, and you can find that online at the Google Code site. Uh, in my opinion, anything that we as developers can do to make our own lives easier, as well as making you know, uh, it better for the end user, is a total win. Um, you know, so OpenID and OAuth bringing people together. So all that we've been talking about might be sounding a little bit like, little bit like Facebook Connect. Um, the combination authorization and authentication thing that Google and Plaxo are working on is almost going to serve the same purpose as Facebook Connect. Kind of. Uh, so what's the difference between the two? Well, OpenID and OAuth work everywhere, and Facebook Connect works on Facebook. So, you know, unless you're already tied to Facebook for some reason, uh, I would put my energy towards OAuth first. Um, I'm not going to open source hippie out on you and demand that we all boycott Facebook. I'm just saying that OpenID and OAuth are open specs that are going to be innovated on, going to be built on. Uh, they're better for everyone, they're available to everyone, and, you know, that's a good thing. Uh, but, you know, on the other hand, Facebook is a big market for some things, and we can't pretend that Facebook Connect doesn't exist. Uh, but, you know, in my opinion, go with OAuth first and Facebook Connect second. All right, so we're coming up to the end, so you know, get your questions ready. Uh, but there's a few more things. Um, now, I hope you enjoyed this. I hope you're going to go home and try this out and actually implement OAuth on your site. Uh, it's very cool, and it's, a, and it's a solution we have to a problem that is here now. Uh, but mil you know, OAuth isn't all milk and honey and roads paved with gold. Uh, the grass is not Willy Wonka edible, but on the flip side, no one's getting sucked up a tube of chocolate either. Uh, that being said, there are a few criticisms that we need to talk about. Um, no fine-grained access control. I mentioned this earlier. Um, in my opinion, it's not needed, and it's kind of premature optimization of the spec. Uh, start with version one, make it simple, get the you know, adoption out there for most use cases, and then build on what people actually need. Uh, and you know, plus, if you really need it, Add it on, make the different APIs like I suggested, or you know, if you're really serious, submit an addition to the spec. You know, you don't have to be Google to come up with a good idea, and if you can put together a nice uh, tech document that describes a simple and backwards compatible way to make this whole thing work out, you know, you might find yourself becoming a spec author in the near future. Okay. Um, so one complaint that I've heard about this whole thing is that it's scary for users. Uh, you know, one minute you're at one site, the next minute you're on another, things are bright and moving quickly and maybe too intense for small children. Um, my personal response to this is that I don't think this is very valid. Um, you know, really, people are clicking from site A to site B all the time, uh, and moving from site to site is not scary, you know? Uh, and as far as it being a new process that people have to get used to, you know, the more people that do it, the more people get used to it, win. Uh, and also, really, all you have to do is be responsible at your own service. Uh, before you redirect the user, tell them, you are about to re be redirected. You know, put up a screenshot of the screen that they're about to be redirected to. Uh, you know, ooh, pretty pictures. You know, people love that stuff. They will get it. Uh, and especially considering the benefits that we get out of OAuth, this is a really small hurdle to overcome. All right. So this is the last criticism, and in my opinion, it's actually the best one. 
So you know, you're a user, you click through the whole process, uh, you, you go to the provider, you type in your username and password, you get redirected back and you have access and everything works and it's awesome, right? Well, no. Um, now, rather than some third, fourth party hacking into this existing you know, uh, consumer provider relationship, uh, the whole thing that you just saw was a complete con. There was no real provider site. Uh, the site that you were trying to get access to just forwarded you to some phishing site with you know, a really slick UI and stuff like that. Fake URL, the whole nine yards, same way phishing works for everything else. Um, your password, your login and password have been stolen. So you know, let's address this. Uh, first off, this is not a hack of a legit setup. This is not a vulnerability between consumer and provider. Uh, so really, this is more criticism of OAuth, the concept, not any particular implementation. Uh, and really, you know, people are always going to say, oh, they can spoof it about any kind of system like this. Um, so what can be done about this? Well, we have to do a good job branding our sites. You know, educate the users. Uh, and if you're a provider, make your authorization process as secure as possible. Uh, you know, one popular thing is showing an image that's not ordinarily visible to the public, and if the user doesn't recognize, you know, maybe a picture of their own head, then they know that the thing is uh, fraudulent. Um, or, you know, do the whole thing over HTTPS and use the browser's built-in UI uh, to indicate a secure site. You know, you've got color-changing address bars, little pictures of padlocks and things like that. And people have already been educated about these types of uh, interfaces. Um, you know, online banking. Uh, everybody uses that, and the banks do a pretty good job of explaining to people HTTPS. Uh, so, you know, this is something they're highly likely to be familiar with already. Um, so, you know, like I said, this criticism is kind of valid, but it's really not very big. Um, so, <laughs> thank you. Uh, OAuth isn't perfect, uh, nothing is, uh, but OAuth does make things a little bit harder to mess with. Um, and you know, this, this isn't a really huge deal. It's a valid concern, we should be aware of it. Is everyone aware of it? Good. Uh, so to finish up, uh, these are the resources that I promised you. Um, if you want some more, you can email me, uh, tim at cloudspace.com. I will get you hooked up with whatever you want. Um, this is the one for how to become an OAuth provider. Uh, there's the URL, or just Google for the title of the document, and you'll find it, no problem. Anyone need any time to write it down? All right. Uh, this is the one for being an OAuth consumer, uh, for developing OAuth clients in Ruby. Uh, it's, notice it's not you know, developing OAuth clients in Rails, because it's Ruby. You can use it for whatever you want. Uh, you, know, you could use OAuth on uh, Matt Williams' Barduino project, and you know, control access to screwdrivers, which would be awesome. Uh, a couple more links for you. Uh, the first one is OAuth.net is the official site uh, where you can find information about the spec, implementation details, and the spec itself. Uh, so the first one is a list of sites that are currently implementing OAuth. Uh, if you are already an OAuth provider or if you're going to become one, go add yourself to the site. It's good publicity, it's good page rank, you know, it's definitely worth being on that list. Uh, the next one is the Google documentation for their OAuth implementation. Um, if you really want to get into this, go and read their docs. Uh, there's a lot of things. Uh, it's very complementary to the spec, I think, uh, and it fills a lot of holes that I think the spec doesn't explain you know, the use cases of very well. With Google, you've got a really good uh, explanation of use cases written by Google, so you know, hopefully they've thought it through and done a really good job with that. I think they did. Um, one other thing, uh, if you're going to go home and check this out, one thing that I'd recommend is uh, have just you know, a notepad next to you and write down all the terminology of all the different parts of the system. Uh, that was something that I did when I was learning this, and it really did help you know, sort of keep things straight in my head a little bit easier. Um, you could do it without that, but I'd rather save you guys a couple minutes on that and make it easier for everybody. 
Um, also, if you really have a very, very deep fundamental, fundamental philosophical OAuth question, actually email the OAuth authors. Uh, all of the, their email addresses are on top of the spec document, which is this last link here. Uh, and I hear they're all really cool about this. Chris Messina is personally interested in you know, getting adoption of OAuth up there. So I, I imagine they'll be very helpful if you need anything from them. Okay. So we covered what is OAuth, you know, uh, authorization, not authentication. What isn't OAuth? It's not things like fine-grained access control. It's not a new login system for your site. You know, your users, they come to your site to log in. They're going to use the same login form that they've been using all along. No changes there. Uh, why use it? It's awesome. How to do it? Uh, a couple lines of code, really simple. Uh, there's a few add-ons uh, that other people have thought of. I'm sure you could come up with a few of your own. Uh, it's a well-designed system. It's, you know, there's tons of explanations of the whole system out there. So if you're trying to look to you know, add things on top of it, it's going to be really easy to do. And then the criticisms, which, like I said, there's only a few that I've been able to find, and they're not even really very valid. Uh, we got some Flickr image credits for all the people that uh, share their photos on, under a commercial, uh, non-commercial license. Appreciate you guys. Um, and then finally, you know, your turn. Uh, what questions do you have? Uh, you said that uh, it required an authentic, uh, authentication system mm -hmm. on your uh, part. Is that, uh, what sort of a requirement is that? <laughs> Uh, I am not sure of the details of how they tie in together. Uh, I just know that it probably has something to do with the way that the data is stored in the database for those, uh, and just the way he wrote his gem, the models integrate much nicer. Um, are you using something else on your site? No, we're not thinking about doing that. I just wondered if that is you know, uh, sort of just a responsibility or it's an actual code. Um, according to his site, those are the three. By the way, uh, for the video, uh, the question was about using RESTful authentication, RESTful OpenID authentication, or uh, acts as authenticated. I believe it's some technical thing uh, that the way his gem works, that's what it integrates with. Um, like I said, it's on his site. The guy knows his code. So, uh, you know, that being said, they are some of the more popular ones out there. So I think it'll cover most uh, use cases. Any other questions? Conference guy. So, um, is there some good docs on the, the intersection between Open, doc, open ID and, and OAuth? It, it seems like you know, there are scenarios where you need a combination. There are things where you just need one piece or the other. Um, I haven't read through the spec. Like, uh, like I said, they did publish. It's you know, uh, it, it's it's a spec unto itself. Um, again, for the video at home, you know, uh, what about the combination OAuth Open ID thing? Uh, it's a spec unto itself. It's a you know a formal addition to the spec. Uh, so it does list out all the all of the parts. I believe basically what it comes down to is just. Um, in the whole back and forth, it's just uh, you know parameters that are stuck on via post or get or whatever, uh, and those whole things are encrypted, uh, you know, using the encryption things we talked about. Um, I believe they're just sticking a few more variables on some of the uh, transactions back and forth. Uh, so, you know, if you didn't want one part or the other, you could, I'm sure, hack it up to you know leave those variables off of uh, that particular part of the transaction. Uh, but if you're really interested, you should go check out the spec. Uh, all these, these specs are actually really nice, really clear, uh, very short, which is good, uh, so you can get through them, you know, go home, crack a beer, and just start reading. Good? Cool. Are there any other questions? All right. Uh, how many of you are actually thinking about, you know, going home and trying this out by a show of hands? You're going to start implementing this in your site? Awesome. I look forward to a whole bunch of new OAuth-enabled uh, applications coming out there. Uh, actually, Robert Dempsey, uh, his expensed application, I know they just integrated OAuth for uh, access for iPhone apps, which is really cool. Uh, like I said, Zentact, uh, there's an extension involved with that. So if you have like browser extensions, uh, which is another thing uh, I'm really big on, um, you know, it's real easy to make OAuth uh, 
of a Firefox extension that consumes OAuth APIs. So, you know, a much more secure way of sharing data back and forth. All right, you know, so thank you for being such a great audience. Uh, I hope everyone's been enjoying the conference so far. Uh, we have the break coming up, and then after that, uh, Will Lineweber is presenting on CouchDB, and then uh, UCF grad Dan Benjamin uh, is gonna be doing the keynote. So thank you and enjoy.